welcome back to track one. Uh, and we have JB Rainsberger connected to us from Canada, right? <laughs> yes. What's what's the temperature? Uh, it, actually, it's only about 17 inside this room right now. I'm not even worried <laughs> about the temperature outside. The heat yeah, didn't come on as early as I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh. right, right. So uh, for, 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 I guess our audience knows JB already for, from previous editions of uh, Defternity. But for those who don't know, JB is an awesome person, brilliant speaker, trainer, consultant. So he definitely has lots of things to share with you. I'm, I'm, not, not, I'm not staying here anymore. Stage is yours, JB. And yeah, feel Great. free to share the screen and I'm disappearing. Great. Thanks very much. It's about, it's about 200 people listening to you now. So yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. All right. Let's see here. If I can find the right one, just a moment here. Yes. Okay. And you're not yet sharing the screen. Yeah, no. I just wanted to double check that I'm sharing the right one. All right, welcome, folks. So, uh, as Andre mentioned, uh, my name is JB Rainsberger. Uh, call me JB or Joe. Both are perfectly fine. And uh, here's how you can reach me. And if at any point you'd like to ask a question after this uh, conference is over, you can always visit ask.jbrains.ca and uh, ask me a question there. So this talk uh, used to be called Integrated Tests are a Scam. And I used to start with this very dramatic opening uh, that was uh, trying to get everyone's attention and to be a call to make a radical change to the way they practice. And that was important years ago when it seemed like a lot of people were making some elementary mistakes that I was worried was going to hurt their projects. And it, you know, if you're familiar with the technology lifecycle uh, adoption curve, um, sometimes you have to scream very loudly in order to get the attention of the, you know, the, the, the innovators and the early adopters and then after a while, screaming is a lot less effective than it used to be. And that's why this talk is now called Beware the Integrated Test Scam. Uh, if you've heard this before, then you might uh, be surprised by uh, perhaps a kinder, gentler uh, version of the talk. And that's very intentional because although uh, scam is still important, um, I don't want to present this as nearly as dire a situation as it used to be, but I still, the scam is still there and I still want you to be aware of it. And the very short version of this talk, if you want the you know, 30 seconds version so that you can then um, stop paying attention, this is really it. I encourage you not to rely on integrated tests to check the basic correctness of your code. I think that a lot of people, when they try to practice even if they're not practicing test-first programming or test-driven development, but if they're doing programmer testing, automated, what we think of as unit testing, that to check that your code does what you think you asked it to do, programmers still routinely over-rely on integrated tests. And what I encourage them to do is to essentially try to write unit tests for smaller units. And it has a bunch of beneficial effects um, but the real key message is, if you want to check the system, if you want to check emergent behavior, if you want to check that, um, that you've chosen the right implementations of the parts of the system, then use system tests for that. But don't use a system test to check something small. Use micro tests for that. That's the short version. So now, what do I mean by all this? So an integrated test it's a little difficult to define, but the basic idea is that an integrated test is any test that runs multiple interesting parts of the system together. And I recognize that I've just replaced a very unclear definition of integrated with a very unclear definition of interesting. And you know, it's a little bit like asking what is comedy. Every time you try to define comedy, somebody comes up with a counterexample to your definition, but that still people would consider comedy. Um, so I'm not going to try to define this very carefully, but. These last two points give you a rough idea of what I mean. If you're familiar with domain-driven designs, terms of entity value and service, then essentially a value is not interesting. A value is usually just a little piece of data in memory um, that has no life cycle. It's a number, a string, a timestamp. 
these kinds of things are rarely interesting. What are interesting usually are services. Things, especially if those services are implemented by something that integrates with outside technology. And a very common risk involved in this, if you sort of want a more concrete thing to think about, one of the very common risks that, that comes out of this integrated test scam is when we have domain behavior and technology integration in the same part of the code, so in the same module, in the same class, in the same object, in the same function, whatever you use to organize code, that usually encourages us to write integrated tests, and that's where the scam comes from. And so if you want a very concrete thing to pay attention to, that's still relatively high level, then this is maybe the biggest point that if you take greater care to separate domain behavior from technology integration, then you will write fewer integrated tests. It'll be easier for you to check the parts of the code that don't need integrated tests with micro tests. Um, but maybe it's not clear to you when something is domain behavior and when it's technology integration. So there are some other ways that we can think about it as well. So what really is the scam? What scam am I talking about? Well. Let's see how quickly I can make this transition here. That wasn't too bad. So here's the scam that I have in mind. This is kind of what it starts with. Probably, if you have worked with um, programmer testing at all, then you're familiar with the problem that all the tests are passing, but still you find a bug. And if you've ever had this experience, you know, there's you, you think that you're doing a really good job of testing your system. You have 1,718 tests that are running uh, every day, every time you push. Maybe you're doing it with your continuous delivery, continuous integration pipeline, whatever it is. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, somebody still finds a bug. Well, when this happens, how do we react? One of the most common reactions we have is to say, oh, there must be some holes in my testing. There must be some areas where our testing isn't as thorough, complete as we need it to be. And therefore, I need to write integrated tests. I can, I can write better than this. I think this is just a question of being a little bit too early and not having enough coffee in me yet. We have a tendency then to write integrated tests because we're worried. What typically happens is that the reason for 100% tests passing, but there's a bug, is that the problem is somehow in the interaction between modules. It's very rarely in a calculation. It's very rarely in something like that. It's more like, OK, there's, there's a gap between some parts of the uh, it's a gap in, in, in some parts of the tests. And I'm not sure where those gaps are. So I'm going to fill those gaps by writing integrated tests, by writing bigger tests that try to test to see if the system hangs together. This is one of our favorite terms, right? We want to make sure that the pieces hang together. I don't know why we say hangs together in English, but that's the term that we use. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, and then the problem with those integrated tests is that the integrated tests are not very good at constraining our design. So if you think about integrated tests, they tend to be bigger. By bigger, I mean that they run bigger parts of the system. They don't focus on a small component like a small function or a method or an object, but they tend to test clusters of objects or clusters of modules together. That's their nature. But part of the problem is that when tests are bigger, when they have bigger scope, they don't give you quite as good feedback about the quality of your design. I like to think of it this way. When the tests get bigger, it's easier for you to write code that's all tangled together, where the dependencies are going in entirely the wrong directions, and it still passes the test. So there's not as much um, criticism of the design when we use integrated tests. And so because of that, we tend to write code which is more tangled. We tend to write code which has worse dependencies. We tend to write code which is where the design is sort of, the design isn't wonderful. The dependencies are painful. 
it's like the, imagine a steel wire that's going through all the furniture in your room. And if you try to push on the steel wire, it can't move because it has to move some chairs and some tables and maybe something that's connected to the wall. And your only options are that you can't move the wire or that when you really try to move the wire, then suddenly a wall comes crashing down. When the code is tangled together like this, uh, so this, let's say less feedback about the design. And when there's less feedback about the design, then because we are programmers and we are lazy by nature, both the good kind of lazy and the bad kind of lazy, if we get less feedback about the design, then we're going to tend to write code which is more tangled together. And when we write code that's more tangled together, it's harder to write tests that check any part of the system in isolation. That's what it means to be tangled, right? It's not just about there's some theoretical problem with the dependencies and they're not in the right direction according to some person's book about how dependencies should be. What really matters about tangled code is that it's harder to check one part of the code without having to run other parts of the code. That's what it means to be tangled. I like the, that's why I like to call these hardwired dependencies. The dependencies are difficult to change, which means that they're difficult to weaken for tests. But what happens if the code is tangled? If the code is tangled, it's harder to write isolated tests. It's harder to write focus tests. It's harder to write micro tests. Well, if it's harder to write micro tests, if there are fewer micro tests, then we make this problem worse. It becomes even more likely. If you have fewer micro tests, that means you have fewer tests. And if you have fewer tests, it's more likely to be in a situation where all the tests pass and still there are bugs. And so this is the scam. The scam is that over here, this is what we try to do to solve the problem. We try to write integrated tests to solve the problem of all my tests pass and yet there are still bugs. But the scam is that the solution actually makes the problem worse. It would be like buying um, you know, headache medicine that makes your headache worse. This is where the scam comes from. And the problem isn't that integrated tests are bad. I know I said that in the past, ignore that. The problem is that if we practice TDD and we are accustomed to using the tests to give us feedback about the design, which is the driven part of test-driven development, but we also try to use integrated tests as a primary way to check important parts of our system, those two things together don't work. It's very difficult to rely on integrated tests to give you feedback about your design. We need those tests to be smaller. If we're going to practice TDD and get useful design feedback from our tests, we need our tests to be smaller. That's the scam. The scam is when you try to put those two things together. And actually, the scam is the solution to the problem actually makes the problem worse. All right. Uh, that's where I want to be. So that's the scam. Now, I want to be clear about this. Again, because part of this is a problem of my own making. Uh, when I first started talking about this 15 years ago, people got the impression that I was saying, integrated tests are always bad and you should never use them. And part of this comes from kind of a psychological trick that we have to use in order to get our message heard, right? If I just say, hey, there's something wrong here, you should probably pay attention. Maybe very few of you will pay attention in the beginning. And when I notice that very few of you are paying attention, I have to yell louder. And I did that for a long time. And I apologize for doing that. You know, I, I wish I didn't feel the need to yell that loudly, but unfortunately that's the way it was at the time. And that gave the impression that I was saying, integrated tests are bad and you should never use them. And indeed, the very even though I tried very hard to say that that wasn't my message, the very first few people who read my articles, who came to my talks, and who were asking me questions said, oh, so you're saying we should never use integrated tests, we should throw them all away. No, no, no. The second article I wrote on this topic was, here is one situation where integrated tests are helpful. But the message, the underlying message, after I stopped yelling, and realize that I could trust my audience to think for themselves, which to be frank, when I was younger, maybe I didn't do very well. Then the message could become clearer that 
The problem here, the scam, is that integrated tests trick you into relying too much on them if you're not careful. If you are careful, if you're aware, if you're paying attention, if you don't feel stress, if you, if you have enough presence of mind, because the world around you isn't push, pressuring you to get things done and pressuring you to move without thinking, then maybe you don't have a problem. But most programmers work in environments where they're constantly under pressure, it's difficult for them to sit and reflect and think about what they are doing and to ask questions about it. They're just focused on doing things. And when you're focusing on just doing something, it's very easy to be caught in the scam. It's very easy to just say, well, the easiest solution will be to just throw integrated tests at the problem. And that way I'll fix it. The Integrated test scam sneaks up on you slowly. It's like an exponential curve. Adding integrated tests to deal with the holes in your testing seems to work very well for a while until very suddenly it doesn't. And that's one of the hard parts about this, right? As humans, not just programmers, as humans in general, we're very bad at delayed gratification, and we're very bad at delayed warnings. If we think that the risk is not going to hurt us today, we worry about it less. And this is one of those things that doesn't hurt until later. And then when it starts hurting, it hurts a lot. And if you're not careful, it will bury you before you realize bad things have happened. So what do we do? If we shouldn't write integrated tests to deal with the 100 tests, 100% 100 tests passing, but there's still bugs problem, how do we check the integration between pieces without actually integrating the pieces together? And that's what I want to describe. And uh, yeah, let's just continue from there. If you've heard this before, then this summary might be enough. I propose a combination of collaboration and contract tests. Collaboration tests check the layer above and contract tests check the layer below. Now I know that stack traces are actually upside down in our programming language, in our, uh, you know, stack traces actually go from the bottom to the top, but in my mind, the stack goes from the top to the bottom. So the entry point is at the top of the, of the uh, stack and then as you go down, you get deeper into the bowels of the system. And so when I talk about layer 12 and layer 13, layer 12 is the client of layer 13. And so the basic idea is that collaboration tests help us check the upper layer and contract tests help us check the lower layer. And we can do this one pair of layers at a time. And one really nice thing about arranging our designs as trees, it's technically directed acyclic graphs, but tree is easier to understand. One of the nice things about uh, designing our systems as trees is the power of a tree is that something that works well at one part of the tree can work equally well at every part of the tree because every part of the tree is a tree, right? That's the power of a tree. That's why trees are related to recursion in computer science. And that's what makes the tree maybe the single most important data structure we know because anything that works at one part of the tree can work at every part of the tree, which means you only have to learn one trick. If you learn one trick, you can use it everywhere and it'll solve your problems. So maybe Fred Brooks was wrong. Maybe there are silver bullets. I'm joking. Of course, there are no silver bullets. But what it tells us is that there's one trick that we can use almost everywhere. And that is the trick for me is combining collaboration and contract tests. Now, the benefit of collaboration tests, by the way, you might know these by another name. The, the historical name for them is interaction tests. And this is where we use test doubles. The idea is that we, if we program to interfaces, and I'm going to use object-oriented terms, but none of this is about object-oriented programming. It's just that that's the common context. I say interface, you can think protocol, you can think higher order function, all of that works. It's all the same. Right? A lambda expression is just an interface with one method, and an interface with one method is just a lambda expression. So it's all the same. And so you might know these as interaction tests, where instead of integrating with your neighbors, 
the things that you directly collaborate with, that you directly connect to, that if we inject those dependencies and hide them behind abstractions like an interface or a Lambda expression, a function signature, then instead of running our code in a test with the production implementation, we run it with a test double, which embodies the contract of that thing. You can think of a test double as a perfect implementation of that interface where all I know are the minimum rules for how to use that interface correctly. And that's the contract. That's what we call the contract, right? The contract of an interface is the rules of behavior of that thing. And so collaboration tests are where we pick one module that we're actually testing, one class, let's say, and we isolate it from all the interesting, expensive external resources the collaborators that it talked to that cause us to write integrated tests. And we hide those details behind an interface, which allows us to then loosen coupling, increase abstraction, write tests that use test doubles instead of talking to the production implementation or the real thing we like to call it. And that way our test can run entirely in memory. So there's two key benefits. First, the tests are faster because they run entirely in memory. And second, the tests focus on not only the behavior of this module, but its interaction with, with its direct neighbors. And if the tests are annoying to write, if they're long, strange, excessively detailed, too much test setup, too many mock objects, then that provides us feedback about the interaction between this module and its direct neighbors. You can be sure that if the test is complicated, that means that the design is complicated and maybe the interactions are complicated. And this helps us see it in a way that integrated tests simply don't allow us to see. Integrated tests still tell us if the code is correct, but it doesn't give us nearly as much feedback about the quality of the design. Contract tests help us answer the question, does when I say I implement this interface, do I implement it correctly? What does it mean to implement that interface? I mean, yes, if I'm working in a language like Java or C Sharp where there's an interface type and there's compile time type checking, then when I say that I'm implementing an interface, I have to actually implement the methods. So I have to conform to part of the contract. I call that part the syntax, right? That's the shape of the contract. Which methods do I have to provide? What are the input types? What are the output types? But that's just a small part of the of the um, that's a small part of the picture. The contract of an interface. I'll talk about the contract of a single function because that's the easiest place to start. The contract of a function isn't just here are the input types and here's the output type, but also what are the rules of behavior? If I return three different kinds of values, when do I return them? What do those values mean? Do I return null or throw an exception? Do I return, do I throw this kind of exception or that kind of exception? When I return a value, what is included in the value? All these are aspects of the contract and contract tests help us answer the question, when I say that I implement an interface, can you trust that? And this is what tends to be missing. Even, I mean, by now, many people actually do collaboration tests and do it quite well. But what tends to be missing are contract tests. And because those contract tests are missing, that's where the bugs are coming from. And that's where programmers are tempted to use integrated tests. And integrated tests are quite an indirect way of checking the contracts, checking that a, an object or a module implements its interface or protocol correctly. Integrated tests are a very indirect way of checking that which are expensive and don't provide as good design feedback. Contract tests are a more direct, immediate way of checking it. And they also have the benefit that then we don't have to write as many slow, painful, uh, brittle tests. We can restrict that because many of these contract tests can run in memory. We reduce the number of tests that actually need to talk to the horrible outside world. So how does this actually work? How do we actually do this? So first I want to show you how it works by zooming in on two layers that talk to each other. 
and then zoom out to the entire application and see what happens. So unfortunately, I have to come down here in order to make that work. There we go. And let's go back here. And so I apologize. I'm probably going to be looking in that direction because my tablet's over there. So let's start with the simple case of two things that talk to each other. So we have the client over here, and we have the supplier over here. And when the client has a hardwired dependency on the supplier, when the client talks to the implementation of the supplier, and that supplier could imagine the supplier is something expensive and annoying, like a database or a web service or something like that. When that dependency is hardwired, then we're forced to write integrated tests. I shouldn't say we're forced to, but it becomes less expensive to write integrated tests. In fact, one of the things that I'm going to talk about towards the end is where do my integrated tests actually end up? Because I never have zero of them. I have some, but fewer. And so when we have a hardwired uh, dependency on the concrete implementation of the supplier, that tempts us, leads us to write integrated tests. And so we solve that problem by introducing an interface. So I'm going to draw a circle, which is the standard UML representation of an interface. It's maybe the one part of UML that I use in my daily practice. So the supplier implements this interface, and the client talks to this interface. And the interface creates this nice wall of separation between the client and the supplier. So now, where, where do I write these tests? Well. The short version is that on this side of the picture is where we write our collaboration tests. And on this side are where we write the contract tests. So collaboration tests answer the question, do I talk to my neighbors correctly? And the contract tests answer the question, do I behave according to the rules? What are the rules? That's that contract, right? A contract in contract tests is, what are the rules of behavior? When I, as the supplier, claim to implement an interface, I'm signing up to behave according to certain rules. Those rules are both in the method signatures or the function signatures, and they're also in things like preconditions and postconditions and invariants, if you want to use the design by contract terms. But I like to just call them the rules of behavior. What aspects of my behavior? can you depend on? When you decide to use an interface, how do you know that you're using it correctly? The rules that you, or the, the aspects of the behavior of that interface that you assume or that you rely on are the contract. When something goes wrong, you're gonna throw an exception. It'll be an exception of this type. Or when something goes wrong, you're going to return null. If you can't find a thing, you're gonna return null. Or if you can't find a thing, you're going to return maybe t. So then I'll get either some value or no value. These are all aspects of a contract. And I should mention at this point, if you work in a language with uh, compile time type checking, there's an awful lot of stuff in the contract that you might be able to embed in the types. And you don't even need contract tests in that case for those things, right? If I say that a method is, or that a function is going to return maybe a customer, there are certain aspects of the contract that are built into the type. And I don't need contract tests for that because the compiler runs those tests for me. But let's say you're working in Java where you just return a customer object. And because of the way Java works, that customer could be null. Now suddenly you have to check that with a test or you have to just trust that it works. And of course, the only reason we ever write tests is because we don't trust that it works. So you trust that it works until it shows some reason that it shouldn't trust you. And then you switch to writing tests. A bit of a digression, but that's the point here. So collaboration tests help me answer the question, does the client talk to the interface correctly? And contract tests help me answer the question, does the supplier implement the interface correctly? And generally speaking, there's sort of what that, I should say, what that means uh, let me pick another color. Uh, let me pick a dark color. Is that this is the place where we use test doubles for our interface. And you might know those as mock objects, but I'm calling them test doubles for reasons that I'm not going to bother explaining now, but I can tell you later if you like. 
the test double is like, how, how do I implement the interface without implementing it? How do I run or simulate or embody a contract of the interface without having to implement it? You could just write a lightweight implementation, right? You could write an in-memory version. You could do those kinds of tricks. I, I like to think specifically of test doubles so that they, they encourage me to focus on the contract. Test doubles are a way for me to express the contract directly using the fewest words possible, using the least code possible. One mistake that programmers often make is they try to use a lightweight implementation, like an in-memory version of, of an interface, for example, in, in place of a database or a web service or something. And although that seems convenient, eventually you reach the point where the lightweight implementation becomes so complicated that you want to write tests for it. And as soon as you've done that, it's now a production implementation. I don't want to write tests for my tests. And so the nice thing about using test doubles, using libraries or using some kind of standard syntax in Java, you might use JMock or Mojito. In C Sharp, you might use n substitute. There are all kinds of ways to do it. In a functional programming language, you can just write functions that return hard-coded results. And that works well too. I want to express the contract as directly as possible. And by writing collaboration tests, that encourages me, or by writing collaboration tests with tests, that encourages me to simply express the contract directly. So in, as an example, we would say, you know, um, let's you say that we are using the repository pattern and we're going to find all customers. So we want to write a test that says, well, what happens if there are no customers to be found? I want to write the controller path for that. Well, I could create a lookup table in memory and then just put nothing in it and use that. And that works perfectly fine. But I find it comforting even, pleasing to say explicitly in my collaboration test, pretend that an implementation of my customer repository, when I call find all customers, returns an empty list. And that seems strange to some people. Maybe it makes more sense for them to just create an in-memory version of the customer repository and don't put any data in it. But I find something really nice about the clarity in a test of saying, pretend that find all customers returns an empty list. What should we do in that case? And that's the nature of a collaboration test. The kinds of tests that we write, that's an example of a collaboration test where we're checking the answer from the interface. Let me pretend what the answers are there are five different kinds of answers. Let me check each one by one and see how the client behaves when it gets each of those five answers. Each of those five answers becomes a test. And instead of having to trick the database or the web service into returning the right answer, I just create an object in memory and I tell it which answer I want and it gives me that answer when I ask for it and that way I can test directly. And that's one of the key points of a collaboration test. That's really how they work. It seems a bit strange, but the way I like to think of it is assuming that the repository returns an empty list of customers, what should we do? Assuming that it returns one customer, what should we do? Assuming that it returns a handful of customers, what should we do? It just becomes part of the given part of given when then. So one kind of collaboration tests are the collaboration tests where the collaborating interface is a query. And so I simulate the answers and that way I can check the client without having to figure out what's the magic way to put the right data in the right databases or to, you know, what are the right query parameters to put in the URL to trick the web service into giving me an empty answer. I can just say, look, if it gives me an empty answer, here's the result. If it gives me one customer, here's what I should do. If it gives me a few, here's what I should do. And we tend to call that stubbing. When we write collaboration tests, we stub queries, right? A query is just a function that returns an, an answer. And the, if the client has to behave differently based on different answers, then we stub the queries. And in an object-oriented language, that usually means implementing the interface to return a hard-coded answer or using our, you know, in Mokito world, it's the Mokito when function that says when this function is called, return that result. And if you're working with Lambda expressions, you can just pass in a Lambda expression that returns a hard-coded answer. It all works the same. The other kind of collaboration test answers a different question, which is, if I need 
to cause an action in the next layer? Am I choosing the right action at the right time? And so we write tests that answer the question. Well, sorry, <laughs> that's going to become confusing in a moment. We write tests that check, does the client ask the next layer the right questions? Or does it issue the correct commands? Do you do the right thing at the right time? And here, we, this is where we use method expectations or function expectations or what people think of when they think of mocks. Assert was called. And the idea here is, although we stub queries, we expect actions. If the goal of this code is to cause an action in the next layer, send a message, um, uh, write a uh, row to a database, write, a, write a, some text to a file, um, invoke the next layer, whatever the action is, it's some kind of side effect, generally speaking. In fact, by definition, I guess, it's some kind of side effect. And I want to know that those side effects are happening at the right time. I don't want to have to know what the side effect is so I can check the results, right? If the idea is that this code is supposed to fire an event, I don't want to have to listen for the event and do the right thing in production. And then, you know, if the, if the, the, um, if the event causes a row written to a database, I don't want to have to go look in the database to see if it was written. If the goal of this part of the system is to fire the event, I just want to listen for those events and check that the right event was fired at the right time. And this is maybe the key point here. The, the place where people get into trouble with these kinds of collaboration tests is they treat everything as though it were an action. And not everything is an action. Some things are just queries. Not everything needs to be checked with an expectation. Sometimes you just want to simulate the response from the collaborator, but you don't care whether it is invoked or not. But many people, when they use test doubles for the first time, they treat everything like an action, like an important side effect. And they check everything. And that's what gives them the feeling that my tests are too tightly coupled to my code and my tests are just duplicating the, um, the implementation details. It can look like that if you treat everything like an action. If you treat everything, the only expectations I want to set in these tests what is the key interaction for this test? If the objective of this test is to fire an event, that's the only thing I want to check. That's the only expectation I want. And so one of the ways that we can reduce our difficulties with writing these kinds of tests is to try to follow the rule of only one assertion per test. So especially if you're using collaboration tests, I encourage that as a starting point. If you're getting started using collaboration tests and you've heard all kinds of horror stories about mock objects and they're gonna destroy your life, Take a moment, try using, following this rule of one assertion per test and an expectation, you know, verify, assert was called, these are assertions. Limit yourself to one assertion per test. Limit yourself to one expectation on a mock object per test. And you'll probably see that your tests become much simpler. And if you need to check multiple assertions, if you need to check multiple expectations in the same test, that's a clue. That's a clue that maybe the design is to, uh, the interactions with the next layer are too detailed and you might be missing the abstraction. I'll mention that, I'll show an example of that in a moment. So that's the collaboration side, test side. You have one set of tests whose job is to check the responses and you have another set of tests whose job is to check, do I talk to the next layer correctly? Now, what about the other side of the equation? By the way, most people out there, uh, I shouldn't say most, Many people out there, many programmers out there do everything on the left side of this diagram actually quite well. Uh, maybe they have some struggles still with, ex with expectations, but the left side of this diagram is sort of what has become mainstream over the last 15 to 20 years. It's what's on the right side that is slowly gaining traction and hasn't become mainstream yet because there's a problem here. How do I know that my stubs and my expectations match reality. We call this the, I call this the test double drift problem. How do I get that warm, fuzzy feeling that the implementation, the supplier, actually matches the stubs and expectations in my collaboration tests? And that's where contract tests come in. And this is the part that tends to be missing. This is the part that causes people to write integrated tests, and then they become a victim of the scam. So, okay, 
Let's look at our collaboration tests. I have some stubs. I have some places where I say, hey, pretend that this method returns 23, because that allows me to check my client for the case where that collaborator returns 23. How do I know that that collaborator is ever going to return 23? Well, I need a contract test that actually checks, hey, in these situations, when you call my method, I'm going to return 23. So if I have a stub that says foo might return 23, then I need a contract test that says, here are the conditions where foo returns 23. And it doesn't have to be 23. It just has to be the same kind of answer as 23. To get formal for a moment, if you have five classes of equivalence in your responses from the interface, then you need at least five tests, one for each class of equivalence. And you just need to pick a value from each class of equivalence. Well, if you have, if 23 is the same as 37 for your purposes, if it doesn't matter whether you return 23 or 37, then it doesn't matter in your test either. You just need a test that checks that class of equivalence. So if I have a test on the left side that says pretend foo returns null, then I need a test on the right side that says here are the conditions under which I return null. And if those things don't match, if, for example, you can't make the supplier return null, then I have to ask the question, why is returning null part of the interface? And that's one of the ways that these contract tests can give us some design feedback. If there are certain um, outcomes which are impossible, then let's remove them from the contract of the interface. And then the rest of the system doesn't have to know about that anymore. And we simplify the design. The other kind of test is a test for actions. If I need to fire an event, then I want to show a test that tries to actually run that event and shows what happens. So now in our collaboration tests, we stub queries and expect actions. In our contract tests, we, uh, let's see, we return stubbed, let's call it stubbed results. And in the other tests, we try the actions. So if we stub a query to say this might return null, then we write a contract test that shows when it returns null. If we stub the query that says we might throw an exception, then we write a test that throws that exception. And if we have uh, a test that says, I need to invoke this action, I need to fire this event, I need to cause this side effect, then we have a contract test that actually shows what happens when you execute that side effect. I say try here because we're testing, but maybe a better way to say it is we write tests that execute the action. And this is how collaboration tests and contract tests fit together. The tests in each layer have to correspond to each other. And unfortunately, there is no automated way to check that. As far as I know, that's an unsolvable problem. I think there are people working on it and there are ways that we can help. But ultimately, a human will have to look at these tests and check that they correspond with each other. What that gives us, however, if we go back to this diagram for a moment, is now we have a new tool. When we see a hole in our testing, instead of throwing an integrated test at the problem, we can look for a missing contract test. So if you've seen those memes going around, you know, two unit tests, but no, uh, two unit tests, but no integration test, where like you can, the two doors are there, but you can't open them because each one prevents the other one from opening. I prefer to say uh, two unit tests, no contract test. The contract test is a less expensive way of achieving the same goal as the integrated test. So how does this all fit together? Uh, I'm looking at the time, I wanna make sure. Yeah, I'll be able to do this. Every system in the history of the world is built like this. Up here, you have a framework. Down here, you have some libraries. And in the middle is you. Frameworks call you, you call libraries. And this isn't literally you, that's your code. So that's sort of the 
zoomed out version of every system you've ever built. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do that. Okay, so now let's actually see what that looks like. Eventually, there's the first part of your system. That's the first bit of code that you write. And maybe you need to talk to some interesting code, which we're going to hide behind interfaces because these are services. If you're just talking to simple values in memory, then you just write simple integrated, uh, write simple assert equals tests and don't worry about it. But if you need some help, if you need some help from some services, which are providing interesting non-trivial behavior, then you hide them behind interfaces. And what that allows you to do is to write collaboration tests up here that answer the question, do I work and do I talk to my neighbors correctly? And then everything above that green line works. But that's not enough because then you need to implement those interfaces. And when you implement those interfaces, that's when you check the contract. So you write contract tests and you write contract tests that show I behave the way my clients are expecting. I behave the way my clients are expecting. And then everything above this green dotted line works. And now here's where the magic of the tree comes in because if it worked once, it can work again. Because maybe this thing needs to talk to something interesting, which then we need to eventually implement. Well, if it worked once, it'll work again. If I write collaboration tests, then everything up here works. And then when I write contract tests to the next layer, everything up here works. And I can do this almost as much, oops, whoa, I'm not sure what happened there. I can do this, oh, my palm is getting away, sorry. I can do this almost as much as I want. Go away, go away. I've never made that. Okay, let's just try this. Okay, uh, I know what happened. Samsung's being a pain in the ass. Let me just hide that behind me. All right. I can do this almost as much as I want. But eventually, we're going to get to the end. And this is where I'll finish for today. Eventually, we're going to get to the end. What happens next? Well, that depends on the situation. In the best case scenario, when it comes time for you to integrate with the horrible outside world, libraries or frameworks, let's talk about the library case. It's easier to deal with. In the best case, let me draw that over here. The simplest case is the case where you just talk to simple stuff, values in memory, lists, timestamps, numbers, this kind of stuff. And if that's all you're talking to, then some very simple assert equals tests in memory is all you need here. Nothing fancy, no collaboration of contract tests, nothing to worry about. Just talk to the things directly, use them, and everything is fine. But the more difficult case is the case where you have to talk to the horrible outside world. And this is the case where it seems like you're forced to write integrated tests. And indeed, this is the only place where I use integrated tests, is at the very last layer between me and the horrible outside world, something I don't want to talk to. What that allows me to do is to test most of my system with complete ignorance of the horrible outside world. And there's one brave layer at the very bottom of my system that volunteers to talk to the horrible outside world for me. And this is where all the integrated tests live. It's the only place I need them. And what's really interesting is those integrated tests are not really tests for my application. They're actually tests for the integration layer. It's like they're tests, they're characterization tests or learning tests for the thing that I'm integrating with. Now, I didn't make the integrated tests go away. So how do I stop the integrated tests from completely dominating my system? And this will be the last point before I stop. So here we are, and we're talking to the horrible outside world. I can draw a more horrible outside world than that. The horrible outside world. 
And if I talk directly to the horrible outside world, then that's where I need to write my integrated tests. But usually what happens is as we add features and the system grows, we end up actually building a handful of things that all talk to the same part of the horrible outside world, the same web, the same, uh, web service, the same files, the same database, something like that. And the good news is there's probably going to be some duplication in there. And if there's duplication in there, then we should remove it. And we remove that duplication in one of two ways. The details are hard to describe, but the structures aren't. And if I can just do this, then I can finish in the next 45 seconds. And for some reason, all right, well, it's not gonna, not gonna help me today. Hello. Oh, what's going on? One way to remove duplication is where the parts in common are the things that need to talk to the horrible outside world. So sometimes when we remove duplication, it ends up like this. And that talks to the horrible outside world. But as soon as I do that, there's an option available to me. If this last thing is the only thing that really needs to talk to the horrible outside world, then I can hide that behind an interface. And now, I've reduced the amount of code that needs to talk to the horrible outside world, and I can use collaboration and contract tests here. What's on the left side here is now happy. And since I'm out of time, I'm going to draw this last diagram and stop. The other possibility is the opposite, that what ends up happening is that the differences are the things that need to talk to the horrible outside world. But what tends to happen in this case is they very frequently end up implementing the same interface. And then the rest of my system can talk to that. And I can put a line here. And I can the, use collaboration and contract tests over here. And this is the only place where I need to use integrated tests. It turns out that as the system grows, when we remove duplication, the last layer that needs to integrate with the horrible outside world gets closer to the horrible outside world and more of my code can be tested with simple collaboration and contract tests. And I think that is where I'll stop. Let me just double check here. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. So I'm not going to have time to continue from here. And if anyone would like to chat and ask questions, then I'm happy to hang around and do that. And Actually, please remember- the, the, there, are, there are quite many questions in yes. Slack. Uh, so yeah, so just, just go there. You, you'll, you'll, I'll, I'll, the I'll answer as many as I can before I'm done for today. Thank you very much, Evie. All Thank right. You. Thanks very much, everyone.